don't you all love me? I bet you do. And if you don't, you will now because guess what I'm going to give away? I had to argue with my co-host over this. Those stingy, stingy partners of mine. But I'm the giving one. So here's what I'm going to give you. That's right. It's me coming from Sal. You're going to get the RGB bundle for free if you win this contest. What is the RGB bundle, by the way? Maps Anabolic. Maps Performance. Maps Aesthetic. Red, green, black. Those are the colors of the program. You get all three. It's like nine months of expert exercise programming. Normally would cost you, I don't know, 300, 400 bucks. You get it for free, but here's what you got to do. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. If you do all of those and you leave a good comment and we pick your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to the RGB bundle. Isn't that amazing? Also, we got a sale going on right now. Here's what it is. Maps Anywhere, 50% off, and the Fit Mom Bundle, which is Maps Anabolic, Maps Anywhere, Maps It, that's three workout programs, plus the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, that's a nutrition component, all that bundled together, discounted normally, take an additional 50% off. So that's the sale. Here's how you can take advantage. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code NOVEMBER50, November 50, with no space, for that discount. All right? Here comes the show. All right, here is your fit tip. Of all, yeah. the, of all the things that you can value with exercise, the amount of calories you burn while you do it is actually the least important. You want to focus on the adaptations and what that means for the body. All right, guys. Let's talk oh, about this blasphemy. Oh, my God. How <laughs> yeah. dare you say that burning the calories? Sweat is everything, Sal. What do you yeah. mean? Calories in, calories out is all that matters, yeah. sir. Well, well, you know what? Calories in versus calories out, that's, that is important for fat loss, but what we forget is the... Your metabolism naturally burning more calories is what you're after, not mm -hmm. the calorie burn while you exercise. Your body adapts so fast to that. Like when the study's done on cardiovascular activity, for example, cardio burns a lot of calories per hour in comparison to other forms of exercise. And over time, the body becomes efficient. Part of it's because it pairs muscle down to make it more efficient at cardio. But the other part of it is your body tries to get better yeah. at those activities, and you find that it starts to that those effects start to negate. You start to lose those. Yeah, you effects. can't blame your body. Your body is just trying to maximize whatever it is you're telling it to do. That's right. Uh, so you have to look at it differently, and and to be able to get your desired results, you, you got to be smart about the way you train. So are you telling me if this is my first time listening to this podcast, and I'm here, and I'm trying to lose thirty to forty pounds? and I'm just getting started on my fitness journey, and one of my friends recommended me, you guys, and you're telling me that I shouldn't do cardio? That's not how I should start to lose body fat? Not quite, but I will, I'll will i say this. If your goal is to lose... Thanks for creating that avatar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if your goal is to lose weight, what you want to do is focus on the adaptations that the exercise that you're choosing induces, and then what does that mean? What do those adaptations mean? Yeah, how about you simplify that since it's my first time listening to no you and problem. I don't know how nerdy you no are. No problem. So if you if I'm doing resistance training or strength training, the primary adaptation is strength and muscle. The side effect of that is a faster metabolism. Cardiovascular activity, since you brought that up, the primary adaptation is endurance, stamina, not strength. And what it does is it, it it tells my body to become more efficient at that activity. Therefore, I can actually slow my metabolism down. And studies will show that when cardio is the only form of exercise in a weight loss protocol with a calorie-restricted diet, you tend to see about half of the weight that's lost being muscle. The body literally is slowing down its metabolism. And that calorie burn that you get from the activity, your body actually starts to balance that out and adapt. So are there ever, are there ever examples of doing cardio in which it can speed my metabolism up? Or is it always catabolic and it always will slow down the metabolism. Well, I think, okay, so cardio has health benefits. So I do want to be clear, right? Um, yeah, yeah, let's take out the health. Like it's, like it's, literally it's good talking for about, you. I'm, I'm here. I want to lose body fat as fast yeah. as I possibly can. That is my main focus. Um, and so is it is it going to help me in pursuit of that or is it not? You know, I think a little bit of cardio might, but the primary form of exercise should be one that speeds up the metabolism. Also, you said fat loss, not weight loss, right? Right. The fastest way to lose weight would be to, you know, tie yourself to a treadmill and, and cut your calories. But then you're going to be losing a lot of muscle along with it. But if you want to lose just body fat, you want to send a signal to your body that says, at least keep this muscle or maybe build a little bit of muscle. That's what you get through resistance training. And so the reason why I, I opened with this is that the average person tends to value exercise, and this is not necessarily their fault. This is how we've been sold through popular fitness media, that when you rank forms of exercise and the average person wants to lose weight, 
the most valuable one is the one that burns most calories. This is yeah. what machines will tell you. Burn this many calories per 30 minutes. There's articles that show you this. And the reality is that's one of the least important things about well, exercise. Well, the general masses are so indoctrinated in that way of thinking that it's it's honestly we should be bringing this up like every other podcast uh, just because it's it's still common common thought. Uh, that's what all of these gym franchises speak to. That's what yep. all of the machines that you buy and infomercials speak to. That's what your jazzer size whatever you're buying online. They're all banking on the fact that they're trying to make these exercises hard, make you sweat, make you feel something, and feel like you need to keep moving your body at an incredibly intense you know, degree in order for you to get anywhere. Yeah, that's the burn calories approach. Burn, Just burn, burn, burn. Burn the calories manually. I'm saying teach your body to burn more calories automatically, right? Speed up your metabolism. And by the way, when, you, when that's your approach, burn as many calories as possible manually with calorie restriction. Your weight loss does initially happen very quickly, uh, some of it being muscle, but then you'll notice, and I'm sure a lot of people watching this have experienced this, you plateau because your body adapts, it becomes more hit, efficient. Hit that wall. And then your next step is, well, I guess I got to cut my calories more. I guess I got to do more you know, cardio. And then you can see at the, end of the, you know, at the end of the day, what that ends up turning into is this unsustainable approach versus making the cornerstone of your routine something that builds strength and muscle. And that results in a overtime faster metabolism for a lot of people. So the weight loss might start off slower, but it's a bit of a snowball effect. So well, later I, on you're I, leaner and it's easier. Yeah, I feel like um, you know, your average person kind of sitting down, the biggest gorilla in the room is that, you know, they're overweight. Or yeah. maybe, you know, that's something that's like, you know, the most impending issue. Uh, and so the first thing they think of is I just need to get rid of the weight. And not not thinking about building their body and building their body up to create you know, something that they could actually have longevity with and strength, but also, you know, you could get to the point where the burning the calories part becomes automatic. Yeah. And it's sustainable. And, and you know, it's, it is important to, cause Did you, you not use loss. elephant because it was offensive. Was that the reason you went? Gorilla? <laughs> uh, you know, no, <laughs> I just thought of uh, changing up the analogy because we're talking about weight loss right I think now. Gorilla is probably more offensive. Yeah, it, now hold on. Those are both, those are interchangeable, <laughs> right? The gorilla in the room or the elephant in the room. I think I don't know. Used, I've never heard gorilla in the room. Do I, I have. I think I have, yeah. yeah oh, I have. There's a grill. Uh, two to one, you're. you're oh, you I don't think yeah. so. You know, have you two guys seen. Elephant uh, in the room. Have you guys it, seen. It is elephant in the room. And by the way, the way. I'm going to go back to weight loss versus fat loss, but have you guys ever seen that video where they're showing how your brain will choose to ignore certain things so you'll effectively be blind to certain things? So there's this video, we've all watched it, I think, where people are throwing a basketball back and forth. And oh, they don't, and then they have a gorilla go through the yeah, background. So the, yeah, yeah, so they say, count how many times the basketball's passed. So you're really focused on the basketball, and then a dude in a gorilla suit walks through, and at the very end, you're expecting them to tell you, you know, how many times has the ball passed, and they say, did you see the gorilla? And you're like, no. Like, what? Is yeah, that, even though it walks right through your line of sight. Is that the same trick as the uh, the bus driver trick? You've know that one before, like people hey, get on. You know, yeah, you're you know you're the bus driver, right? And yeah. let me let's see if you can figure out how many people get on and off the bus, and then you go through the whole thing of like you go to this stop, you pick up five people, then the next stop, two people get off, yeah. and seven more people get on, and the next stop, and you do that, and at the very end of it, you go, "Who's driving the bus?" Well, no, you say, "What color are the bus driver's eyes?" Oh, mm. and then people are like, "Huh." You're, and they got the math, 72. Because yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, so. they're so focused on that task specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah so I think- blind. It's elephant in the room and then the 800-pound gorilla. Yes, that's the that's gorilla. That's another story uh, saying yeah. that has no relationship to the elephant. So well, it doesn't mean the same thing? does not mean I the guess. same thing. Yes. Can you read the quote that it says? <laughs> so the 800-pound gorilla is an American English expression for a person or organization so powerful that it can act without regard to the rights of others or the law. Wow, we used that totally wrong. Uh, yeah. So, well, yeah, we, we kind of um, failed on that one. Well, write that down, Adam. You that's, guys were on my side, and then you went and fucked it up, Doug. Yeah, that's Thanks a lot. This is like, Adam's on a roll. Yeah. This is the second time. Yeah. No, I, I mismatched. Dude, I can't be on the second I, time 40 times, hey. bro. <laughs> I merge analogies, like, constantly. Yeah. So, All right, so, so. You, so you said weight loss. I want to I want to make this point real quick. If you looked at a picture of a 200-pound, 6-foot male at 10% body fat and a 200-pound, 6-foot male at 18% body fat, they would weigh exactly the same. They would look way different. And this right. is true for a 140-pound female at 19% versus 30%. They're way the same, but they look radically different. Yeah. And, and with strength training and resistance training, you get body composition change, not just 
weight loss. So I did want to make that. Can point. you can you simplify a little bit more for this person too that's listening the the physiology behind why why would our body slow its metabolism down because of doing cardio? So in be, a simple way as you can. Okay, so it's not just doing cardio. It's that's the only way or the primary way that you train in combination with a calorie deficit. Your body's always trying to get better at what you're asking it to do, right? So if I'm doing lots of steady state, long distance type cardio, long distance running or cycling or swimming, I'm asking my body to build lots of endurance and stamina. I don't need a lot of strength. In fact, you need very little strength for endurance type activity. And because I'm burning a lot of calories while doing that activity, my body is trying to become more efficient at that activity. So I don't need muscle, I need endurance, and I need to become more efficient it pairs muscle down. doesn't burn the muscle. That's different. It just pairs it down to make you a more efficient cardio machine. Not unlike a AI car that would adapt to your driving habits. You know, if I drew, if I drove my car 400 miles at 35 miles an hour every single day, it would adapt to be a very low energy consuming vehicle versus if I took my car to the, the quarter mile and practiced a couple quarter miles every day, my car would adapt and become you know very energy even, inefficient. Even simpler way would be saying that you're teaching your body to need less calories Correct. a day to survive. Right. So the Absolutely. pairing down, because muscle needs more calories to survive. It's a survival it's a, mechanism. It's expensive than, tissue. Than fat does. And by you pushing the body, by burning lots of calories and consuming very little, of course, the initial thing is to lose weight, i.e. body fat and probably some muscle. But the consequences of that is the body becomes efficient at that, and then it slows the metabolism down, meaning that it doesn't need as many calories as what it needed just two months ago when you were eating twice as much and doing no cardio. Yeah, mm -hmm. so like if you look at like the biggest loser, um, I don't, I, we read an article a long time ago. I forgot what it was, but the average calories consumed after the show to maintain that weight loss, it was something in the neighborhood of like 1,600 calories with tons and tons and tons of activity. So all these people lost 100 pounds. But now they're in a position where they have to work out so much and eat very little to maintain their bodies. And that's an extreme example, but obviously unsustainable. Yeah. We want to be, get people in a position to where they burn more calories at the end of their fat loss journey. And they don't have to work out like crazy to maintain that calorie burn because they've got a faster metabolism, right, much right. more sustainable. And that's the approach well, that And I the opposite is true that the, like we're, to my point is that uh, you lift weights, say no cardio, and for every pound of muscle that you gain over the course of weeks or months, your body now needs more calories in order to sustain that in, in turn speeding the metabolism. Yeah, up. and it's not even just the muscle gain because I know there's someone watching right now who's like, oh, there's a study that showed every pound of muscle only needs 15 calories or whatever. There's a range of calorie burn your metabolism will, will achieve with the same lean body mass that you currently have. There's a, there's a range of calories and your body can choose to be more or less efficient. It's a very complicated process, but you could take someone and just because you're telling the body you need strength and muscle and feeding it a certain way, even if they don't gain muscle, their metabolism will move more towards the burning more calories. If you restrict their calories and do forms of exercise that tell the body, we need to become more efficient. Even if they don't lose any lean body mass, within that range, they'll move over to another direction. And this is why people like Lane Norton, for example, argues in favor of reverse dieting and all that kind of stuff when people are like, oh, you know, five pounds of muscle doesn't burn that more many more calories, you know, type of argument. Has has more to do with that range. And then of course, extra muscle does require. Speaking of you know. calories, metabolism, all this stuff, did you see that company? I think it's Cygnos. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. S-I-G-N-O-S. Maybe Doug could pull it up for us. They just, I think they just took on took on 15 million. I think that's what they Is just this did. Is the continual glucose monitor? Yes. Yeah. It's supposed to be pretty sophisticated too. It's supposed to like help them predict and tell them what foods they should. And really? Should. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Doug could pull it up for us. I just saw it in my uh, tech yeah. crunch. I saw article. that it was uh, apparently was also giving diet recommendations, which is interesting because not just like uh, you kind of taking a, a food item and then kind of watching to see how that affects your blood sugar level, but also like based off of that, now it could have some recommendations. Yeah, right? that's that's a that's a big um, it's a big leap. That's a big plus because the previous ones just told you 
Here's how your insulin like here's responds. the data here. You so can what, what do you guys think? I mean, I, I, we haven't. It's been a long time. We actually talked a, a lot about glucose monitors uh, a couple of years back. It just there hasn't been a lot of news around them since then. I mean, it was I think it was uh, on the front end of kind of cutting edge stuff yeah. in the last decade, and then it's kind of been quiet for a while. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, you, they had to be uh, prescribed, right? So you couldn't because they're invasive, right? Because right. they have like little tiny needles that yeah. go in, and they were kind of making headway in terms of like making that more accessible for your. Average Average person, and that was sort of like the last time we had discussed it. But which was, there's a lot of potential, I think, benefit to these uh, in terms of like getting insight. Yeah, you, you needed a prescription. So if this is available without a prescription, that's a big plus. I do, I believe so. I think that's part of it. And maybe Doug, you can find that the article that I read. I think, and I don't know how they're doing that because I because I thought that if you do have anything that's even invasive like that at all that goes into your. It's a tiny, tiny, oh, it's little tiny. hair it's thin little needle, needle, needle that needle. goes in So I don't know what they what they did to to bypass that, but I think that you don't need a prescription to get with this company, and that's why it's it's blowing you up. Know what? And they're they're so thinking they're going to be the leaders. Here's the pros and cons, in my opinion, of, of these. Um, I think fitness and health minded people will benefit greatly from this. That's right. I think the average person, it's not going to make a dent because I'm 100 percent on yeah. board. It with doesn't you. address. The behaviors that are associated with eating a particular it's, way. And that's the real issue. It's not that people don't know that they're eating necessarily bad food or they can make better food choices. It's the behaviors around them. And it's just really hard because of that. And if you don't address the behaviors and the psychological piece, you can give someone a diet plan. You can tell them all the perfect foods for their body and whatever. And they're just, it's just not going to work. Well, it's the same reason why the Fitbit didn't solve the obesity problem. Right. I mean, I think that was, I think yeah. that's a tremendous tool. It's a very broad stroke. That they're and I, I really do. I agree with you. I think, and there, by the way, there's exceptions to the rule, right? There, There's always that that one client or uh, that you had that they just needed that one more piece of, of, of data to, to bring it all together for them to make sense of, oh, that's why I couldn't lose weight. Now I get it. And then that, that's, that's so there's always exceptions to the rule, but for the general population, the same people that have a hard time writing down and tracking their food or disciplining themselves to go to the gym every single day or look at their Fitbit to see what the feedback gives you are the same people that I think are going to have a hard time with this. Yeah. And this thing's even uglier and more invasive than like a Fitbit. And so I really have a feeling the same people that buy a Fitbit, the same people that use the Fat Secret app or the My Fitness Pal are the same people that are going to get Agreed. a kick out of something like this. Agree. It has to be a tool that works on the behavior somehow, not just giving you information. That's why I think, and I'm not, this is not definitely not the first choice for me, but I think that that Novo Nordisk, uh, that's a pharma company that has that weight loss drug. I think that's going to have a greater impact because you inject yourself once a week and then you just eat less because well, you have less appetite. Of course that will be, yeah. dude. I mean, it, it, anytime focus, you can find a magic pill to <laughs> help with fat loss or muscle you gaining, mean, I don't have it to will do any always of the do work better. Yeah, and then it works. The other stuff requires inputting, yeah. following rules, doing stuff. That's if a I general just, population uh, goldmine. It yeah. is because you, you do it and, it and it just makes you eat less. You're just not as hungry. So it, it does work on the behavior from that aspect. It doesn't get to the root root. Of no. the behavior, but it's a it's it's much more like oh I just get this injection then just eat like I normally do and I end up eating less. Do you remember that company I brought up a long time ago? I wonder how they're doing. I forgot the name of it, but it was like a, I think you like ate it was like a gum or oh yeah a, you suck on it and then it made like sugar taste like uh, yes. disgusting or whatever. Or, or, I forgot all about that company. I wonder how they're doing. If you that's know what I, I didn't like about that is that you still have to choose to make food not taste good. Now if they could give you like mm -hmm. a like a pill. And then that pill just works for like a week, mm. and then that would work. But I, I could see people being like, <laughs> I mean, people, I don't so, want to take that. People would still hate that, though, you know? Because yeah. yeah. again, this is like punishing yourself. Yeah. Because it's like, well, I can't, I can't enjoy this food, you know. Instead of like really dealing with the fact that yeah. uh, you know the underlying issue that's really there. Well, hey, speaking of enjoying food, I wanted to ask Doug because I saw when we were up in Truckee, mm. uh, you pulled the new uh, Organifi creamer. What'd you think of it? I liked it. I mean, it, it reminds me a bit of the bulletproof coffee. That's what I thought. Yeah. So it has the, the MCT oil taste, a bit of a coconut taste. It's very coconut. Does it so, have MCT? I know it obviously it, had coconut. I can taste like that. It does. Oh, so it has coconut. MCT in it yeah, also? Yeah. So ha here, I'll, I'll read the ingredients to you. So one serving of this creamer is about 50 calories. Not bad. It's got coconut milk powder, coconut sugar, coconut MCT powder, uh, coconut water. Then there's um, organic aquamin. So this is from marine algae. Magnesium, sea salt, aloe vera. 
basically you're getting electrolytes um, and some and some phytonutrients, in phytonutrients there. and healthy fats. Yeah. Now, from for sugar my, too, yeah, or no? A tiny bit, very yeah, very little bit. Coconut. Yeah, you're looking at a total of uh, three grams of sugar. Oh, okay. For a so very minimal. But the fats really help your body absorb the caffeine in a more sustainable kind of sustained way. You get kind of this more even. That's why people like bulletproof. I think so much. Yeah. They felt longer lasting. It, it kind of takes your energy a little further and also yeah. keeps you a little bit more satiated. Yeah. So you except know. bulletproof's like it's like four hundred or five hundred calories. Yeah, we haven't yeah, talked well, about uh, bulletproof coffee in a very long time. So I'm curious to like I mean there was a kick I know that everybody went on where they were using it trying style, it and yeah. and I feel like there's two very distinct camps here. You either talk mad shit about it that it's ridiculous that this whole idea of like, oh for fat loss, go ahead and start your day with a four hundred yeah. calorie <laughs> cup yeah. of coffee. That's a great idea. And then other people that swear by it and say that it's amazing. How do you guys feel about it as a strategy for somebody to, you know, for overall health or what, of, or so fat loss? It, I think it tastes good. Okay, here's uh, why it helps to some. Each their own. Yeah, here's how it helps some people lose weight. They drink this big coffee in the morning with butter and coconut oil, or MCT oil in it, and then they don't eat breakfast and lunch and then eat dinner. So the weight loss really is the yeah. fact that they had 300 or 400 calories all day instead of 800 calories all yeah. day because they ate breakfast and lunch. So they're skipping meals and then eating dinner and then they think it's but the I coffee. But I found that's a temporary thing, yeah. right? Because the longer you go skipping that breakfast, like it has more of a detriment over time. Uh, for me, in terms of like metabolism and everything, I've noticed that. Like, you know, like th again, this is just one of those things. Like if you are pulling out some of your normal habits of like where you're this is where I get a majority of my calories and I'm reducing that right now. You know, you're going to see benefit to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think when it comes to fasting, um, some of the best, biggest benefits come from doing it, not all the time, but long fasts every three or four months. That's where you see some pretty profound, like a, like a 48, 72 hour fast. Uh, you see some really, really big. Well, what results. about like uh, mental clarity? So, because one of the things I remember, I remember feeling sharper from fasting. And then, doesn't MCT oil have some benefits when it comes to mental clarity? If you're in, if you're, if you're in, like a ketogenic state, yeah. If you're in ketosis, MCTs get converted really quickly to ketones, so you get this energy right away. Now, I feel clear too when I fast, but I save it for when I need it. I don't do it every day. I know I get, the, I get a, I start to lose the effect if I do it all the time. Mm. But if I'm like, which oh, makes crap. sense, body just gets adapted and used to yeah, it. Yeah. But if I'm like, oh, we got three podcasts and you know, I want to be super sharp, then I'll fast uh, throughout all of them. And then I'll find myself being, you know, have you sharper. guys tried, I think it's Laird Hamilton. He has a version with like turmeric and does like these. Uh, oh, golden. What do they call it? Golden milk or golden? Yeah. yeah that yeah. sounds like it'd be gross. It, I don't know. It sounds interesting. Have you had, yeah, turmeric in lattes is not too bad, actually. No. Well, What's that's it? what the uh, Organifi gold juice is, is right. turmeric. Yes. I, I, that, now, that tastes amazing. Yeah, but though. Organifi has some, like, magic stuff going on. <laughs> they do. I'm yeah, serious. It's like pumpkin like, spice. Their green juice is amazing. Like, everything they've made, like, that's that's why they that company has hit it out the park. Is yes. Because it tastes amazing and it's good for you it's like yeah, they, they, they figured it out you normally get either or it's either you're all health and you taste like you're very healthy or you taste amazing and you're just not very healthy yeah you ever look at like protein bars at the gas station yeah and you look at the macros you mean, like, a sneak, you mean a snickers bar with <laughs> 10 grams of protein in yeah. it that's it's literally like i'll never candy. forget as as yeah. a young trainer when that like light bulb finally went off for me i remember being at it it was actually at a gas it's probably station. a detour bar right or something like yeah that. and i and i remember looking at, at the sugar content the total calories everything the fat all that it was like and i had like a snickers bar and it's like literally this is just a snickers bar with 10 grams of protein, which even the Snickers bar, I think has two or three. So mm -hmm. I'm getting like seven more grams of protein yeah. with my, <laughs> with my you know, quote unquote healthy protein bar. It's funny. I had this conversation with my cousins yesterday where, where he was like, oh, the future is insect powder because it's so easy to make insects and it's got Dude, protein. Been saying that for a long And I'm time. like, listen, buddy, I said, here's the problem. The problem is people don't value food for its nutrition or its health. People largely value food mostly for how much how good it tastes. Yeah. And if you look at any food category, breakfast, lunch, dinner, holiday foods, health foods, look at health foods. The top selling health foods are not the healthiest. They're the ones that taste the best. Yeah. That's yeah. just what sells the most. Yeah, yeah. That's why I mean, you know, if you're a company like Organifi, uh, you've You've done both. That's no no wonder that company. Yeah, they figured they figured crushed, that, that out. Uh, and hey, did you guys see? Um, you guys know like all, have you guys seen like all the competitors with the whole smart glasses and stuff? Are you paying attention to that at all? You know, at the Google glasses did their thing and it kind of failed. And then who else did a, a another? There was another company that did it. And I just saw recently um, Ray Ban. Ray Ban has smart glasses now. 
Have you so, seen these? Now, what do they show Ray in the lens? Band. What's smart about They're it? Not okay, a tech company. So it's got a, it's got built in like head, you can listen to music. Mm-hmm. It's got cameras on it, oh, so they, you can take have, videos yeah. and and take photos, and it's all built. So of all the glasses, smart glasses that I've seen, these Ray Bans look the coolest. But I was watching this whole, like someone did, you know, one of those unpacking on YouTube and I watched like them break it all down and it's, the camera's not as good as the one on your phone. Yeah. The speakers in it aren't as good as your AirPods or, or headphones. Mm. It doesn't do anything else special. The video time is, is short and limited on it. The quality of the video and is, 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 is not comparable to your- It's just version one, right? So it's, it's trying to so, combine all those in one place. And I think that's the selling point is that it's, it's just the beginning of where they're going to try and take this. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me them? of the, the, oh yeah, they look good. Yeah. They did a good job of I mean, looking like, tri- it's hard to tell. I mean, you, I mean, cause I told you guys, you can tell there's cameras there, Yeah, but they, they look Pretty yeah. close to the. Didn't Snapchat have some? Snapchat for a while? did them yeah. for a while and they failed. We had a pair. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, we, we had a pair. I know. So this it's is really... a this is actually a direct partnership, by the way, with Facebook. Hmm. Oh, so really? these are Facebook Ray Bands. Wow. So it's connected to your your Facebook stories. So you could be. So it's... not only is Facebook listening to me on my phone, they're going to watch everything. So I'm okay, so you have your app open and you have your glasses on. So basically, whatever you're capturing, can you look at it real time on your phone, like what you're like looking at with your video? I believe you can do that. I know for sure what you can do is take photos cool. or video, and then it automatically uploads to your Facebook story. So you know what it reminds me of? When phones first had cameras on them, the camera market was still good because the cameras on phones sucked. Mm -hmm. But eventually cameras on phones got as good as the ones that you could buy separately and then the camera market just collapsed. Eventually these glasses are going to have all these features that are going to be excellent. And it, it, it's going to create well, a new market. So what do you opinion. think it'll be? What will it make obsolete? Because it's not going to out-compete or at least I don't think it's here's gonna... what I envision. What um, I watched uh, Free Guy, right? That was a great movie, and in the in that movie, he's in the video game. He puts on his glasses, and all of a sudden, things appear. Yeah, from the him. augmented reality, something like that. Like I put the glasses on, and as I'm walking, and I walk by this, you know, this Mexican food place. And and their Yelp reviews pop up right in front of me. And if I want, I can look more, Whoa. or I can order from from right from my glasses. Or as I'm walking, if there's a feature turned on, it's got facial recognition. It'll pull up someone's Instagram right above their head as I look at them. Or you know, I'm looking at a product and I can see the reviews, or I can look it up instantly. So it's all in front of me whenever I want, and I can access all. That's you, how I picture it in the future. Yeah, you know, it'd be a massive hit. You know how big Pokemon Go was. You know, with their, I could see that easily of like having some little augmented reality dinosaur thing, you know, off that they have to go find or yeah. whatever. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure like, again, this will be kind of weird because I don't know what the rules are with that and marketing to kids and all that kind of stuff. But I can see a lot of potential. Dude, well, there. this is what I brought up the other day of when I asked you guys, what do, what do you think is going to take off first, AR or VR? Because you have a, a split with some of the, the big monsters, right? I the think big, AR. Well, I think AR is like first only because I think it's, it's not it's as, an easier transition. It doesn't take as much a commitment. Yeah. Because here's the thing with VR, you got to be sitting down you got to have this thing covering you you can't just do normal things you have to be committed to sitting down and having this as like your entertainment think about all the apps that they can make with ar glasses right imagine health apps so i put on my glasses it does a bunch of stuff and then when i look at food it calculates the macros it yeah. recognizes chicken breast three ounces you know, estimated calories, estimated macros. Enter this in, yes, beep, and I am tri- That would make sense. I- imagine I'm at a gym and I look at a machine and, and it shows me how to use that machine and what body parts. You know, imagine, I mean, imagine going to a nightclub and you're looking around, it picks up people's faces or you're driving and you can put your directions on right away in your field well, of view through your glasses. Like the app creators are going to go crazy. with this Either thing. way, I mean, it has to look cool. Because like, yeah. if it doesn't look cool, the consumers are not well, going to get behind it. So I could see potential, mainly because like Ray Ban's already kind of a cool brand, and they they make yeah. great looking frames, much like you know Felix Gray, which I actually just bought. So you remember we talked about the amber lens version of the, it, so the strongest for, for the ones nights, were, yeah. yeah. So I got them mainly for the screen initially for my kids, uh, because they're on iPads or on laptops, all that kind of stuff all the time. They get the eye strain, they act like little monsters after they're done, and that's <laughs> helped. But uh, you know, the getting them to the bed to bed part, like I don't, I don't. 
I don't do what you do with like, you know, lighting candles and all that, yeah. which I, I could get better at that. But uh, I've, I just bought those. And I'm hoping that'll be sort of the next step in that direction to get them to calm down a little bit. Yeah. Your, <laughs> before kids, bed. Are, your kids are on. They're crazy. They're on fire. Do you, so are you, have you noticed that they sleep easier if they wear them at night? Before bed? Yeah, and I think that the amber, I, I'm anticipating that's going to be even better because, you know, it, it sort of helps kind of get, you know, the circadian rhythm now, in that so I direction. Can't, I, if I watch, if I'm going to watch a movie right before bed and I put those on, I give myself about 35, 40 minutes because then I can't stay awake. So if I'm going to watch a full movie, I can't put them on. Because about 35 minutes in, I find myself like, oh. Uh, yeah, the amber off. ones. Yeah, the yeah, really, really strong yeah, ones. Yeah, I'll use the daytime ones exactly. if I'm watching a, watching a movie like that. Now, the part I have, I'm curious as a dad who doesn't have kids as old as your guys' kids is, do you feel, though, like you're the dad who's like trying to force your kids to do that? Or do you feel like they're accepting it and they like it? Like, what does it feel like trying to, to wear get, the glasses? Yes. Uh -huh. I'm trying to make it more almost like it's a uniform. Like it's yeah. like sort of something that like if you're going to spend time on here, you got to, you know, put on the glasses. It's yeah. just like oh, okay. a thing they do. Yeah. And I, I, you know what? I'll, I'll be honest. I haven't been super good about it recently and they won't hmm. if I don't say something. So I think it's like one of those like. So Justin's a better father. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say anything, yeah. but yeah, we're on top of it. No, it's true. No, I think, I think it's like you, you know, it's like one of those things like, oh, you want to go into electronics? You have to wear this. I don't think they'll do it on their own. Although you hope that they notice the difference. Oh, you definitely have to be involved to make sure you establish the ritual. Yeah. I was but just wondering if, they, it, if they like maybe they thought they were cool because they are cool. They're not. They're not dorky like the yeah. old you know blue Do blocker kids classes. Think so different things are cool these days. Bro. Well, that, so that this is why True. I'm asking because I'm wondering like. Eh, because you guys are bringing it is probably why it's not cool. If like a friend or somebody else introduced it to them, maybe it would be cool. Yeah. Or if they saw like somebody who's See, maybe a, the move is to get all their friends. Yeah. Classes. Or like, you know, maybe yeah. Felix Gray needs to get some of these young YouTube influencer people to be wearing them. And so then maybe that's when the kids 100%, take. 100% dude. All those kids that are on YouTube, like talking about video games. Yes. They should all be wearing I those. I feel like if they were, if they were rocking it, then, then the kids would be like, oh, this is cool. And they can make it kind of trendy. But I think my dad telling me like, you need to put these on before you get on the computer because it's going to strain your eyes. It's like you felt like, oh, I can't shoot a BB gun because I'm going to shoot my eye out. That's what uh, you feel like, you know? So you know, you know what this reminds me of? Like, Maybe. You guys remember, you know the movie 21 Jump Street? The, the remake that was like, I don't know, how old it is now, maybe 10 years ago, eight years ago. Channing Tatum. And yeah, all. hilarious, right? I watched that the other day. It's so true, right? Because they go back to high school and what used to be cool isn't cool anymore. Yeah. I was dying. He had his like cool muscle car and they're like, oh, man. Yeah. He's, he's like, Trans Am. How many, yeah. how you know, many miles per gallon is that? And he's like, bragging. He's like, I don't know, six. And they're like, yeah. God, that's terrible. Terrible for the yeah, environment. Yeah. Right. Huh? His, back, his <laughs> backpack on one strap versus two, yeah. and all the stuff was yeah, backwards. Exactly. And he's, and he's like, if anybody steps, you punch him right away. And then there's like that this kid, and he punches him. And they're like, you punched a, the gay black kid in the school. And he's like, oh my god, no. why would you? Is it because he? Yeah. He's like, what am I doing, dude? I, I I feel like I never even told you guys, but he filmed a, a movie like my old house that I sold like right down the street recently uh, during the pandemic. I didn't know that. Yeah. I wow. think it's called like dog something. Not dog town. Was Courtney there? She, did she watch all this? Yeah, I told her about it. And she got all excited. <laughs> and I was like, well, he's not here now. Okay. Oh, what, was, <laughs> what was that new one that he did? Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to look it up. But uh, it was it was so random because there was like all these trailers and I was driving by. And at one point they had like somebody out there like directing traffic. I'm like, I'm just trying to get to my house. This is one, you know, small road that's like goes to a dead end. And so they pick this one random like off road that goes up through all this like ivy and it's like sort of off adjacent to that road. And anyways, I have no idea like what they shot there. I'm really curious though. Cause like he was there and then some other like famous person. I'm like, what the hell are they doing? Like in my backyard. Yeah. It was weird. Ah, cool. Yeah. I know you're a big fan too. I am. I, I, oh, it's just I called dog. Some of his movies. The movie's called dog. Yeah. Dog. Coming out in there 2022. Wow, good job, Doug. Yeah. Boom. I found uh, it. Looking forward to that. Dude, <sighs> speaking of like like famous people, okay, what the hell did you send yesterday with that cover band? Oh, the- Bro. Okay, so I forget the name First of the band. First of all, Is I didn't realize it was fully filmed. Oh, yeah. So it's the- So it, I got a DM. I love, I love so our wait, listeners- it's, there was like a rage. It was it's brass a rage against the machine, right? Or the a, rage against the machine is was the concert. It was the opener. So whoever the band is, uh, I'll have to look up the name of the band. I'm gonna find it, it brass, right now. I thought it was brass against the machine. You might I'm, be right if I'm correct. Not brass against the machine. Yeah, because like they're brass instruments. They're 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 brass. Something. It was rage against the machine. They open up for. And they're and they're they, yeah. They're, but I think they're a cover band. They're a cover band. Point. Yeah. Okay. It is. It's brass against. 
Oh, just Brass Against. Brass against. Yeah, so yeah. I'm reading it. It's called Brass Against. And, I mean, they look like a badass group or whatever. But the vocalist, the girl that sings in it, yeah. Sophia Eurista. Uh, what an ironic pad, last pad, name. Pad, look, it's all over the place. It's trending right now. One day ago, two hours ago. Literally, literally a her fan. call Eurinista. A, fran, a fan goes on stage, and apparently she'd been complaining to the audience how she has to go to the bathroom. So this guy's like, I don't know how it went went down, but the dude laid down. You, the whole thing's filmed. She stood over him, yeah. pulled her pants down, squatted, and pee. And I mean, you it wasn't I, a little bit of pee, dude. You know what I feel like? She oh. peed a lot on video. his face. Yeah. yeah. All <laughs> over. The no, no, no. It was like legit, legit, right? Yeah. So I think- Now, the I dude didn't look like he was upset. I think I mean, there's you, this <laughs> movement that's been going on for a while it. now of like, you know, badass, like famous chicks- Going back in history and looking at the most ridiculous things that men did and trying to one up it. Did a guy do that? Mm. No, not that specifically that. But you've had like Ozzy Osbourne bite the head off of a bat, and you've I don't had think a guys dude would get a, get away with peeing on a chick uh, in, on stage. You get arrested. Yeah, that. That's, so this is one upping it. That's my point. I've heard my some point stories is about Marilyn. Is like it, you know, and what's her uh, what's her name who came out with the WAP song? It's like it's not yeah. like men haven't done songs that are you know me so horny or so crazy over the top right, in the right. past. I right. feel like there's this movie movement now from from women in in powerful positions or fame to go like all right what did some of the dudes do in this i'm gonna fucking yeah i'm gonna pee on you i'm gonna one up that i'm gonna piss on a guy's face i I couldn't believe i thought like you know because they're oh it was filmed by a fan i thought you kind of see it no no yeah it's like full on yeah and it's not like drip drip it's like splash and it's going yeah and the the dude they had a mop you yeah. know, like after she and the done. dude underneath was. I that's think, like a whole. Isn't that like a whole? Uh, that's a whole porn category, right? Golden showers, and then they <laughs> call that. That's that's, 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 a, a, that's, a, that's one of those things that yeah. um, Sal was saying he's really into. Oh uh, uh, come on, bro! <laughs> come on! <laughs> oh, that was an off-air conversation. Come Sorry, on, I forgot. Right. I forgot. He's like a raincoat. Hey, that's hey, all. change of directions. I have something, Doug. Pull this up. This is better for your search engine here. Pull up. Yeah. Uner Universal Basic Mobility. I want you to read the article to the guys because I actually want to have a discussion. I know these guys aren't up the on this. So I've heard of universal basic income. income but it's exactly what's, like that. The government's going to provide mobility exercises for everybody. No, Taxpayers yeah, right. You're, cl- like, you're close. What? Um, Get it's, out well, here. it's not around exercise. It's around movement. It's around transportation. So they are trying. To, it's already being passed right now in Oakland, and they're already. Oh, doing, they're going to subsidize bus rides, e-bikes, and scooters. Already happening. So uh, it's already uh, happening. So they're there, and and it's very it, interesting because it goes in line with our, our talk about how we talked about how cars are going to kind of go yeah. away, and there's going to be this, you know, no one owns anymore. You just but have it's a, an, it incentivizes you to go public transportation instead of like pen like taxing you for your carbon emissions, whatever. Like no, you know what? This is even better because it's e bikes and scooters. So here's okay. So if you look at government funded things. Oftentimes you'll find that they're just not efficient. They cost more than they you return, and they're not very effective. For example, in California, we have this 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 what do they call it the the rail to nowhere. We've been building this high speed rail forever. <laughs> yeah. it's Is cost, this still happening? It costs us. Yeah. I don't know how many hundreds of millions or maybe billions this of dollars. Been like a decade. I thought so. it's already done, and there's people I that think don't they even halted use it. It. Huh? It, it, it. I think they halted it, and it, but it's 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 a complete waste of money. A boondoggle. We're sp- it's obviously to. Special interest groups. Nobody cares about it. I thought that but, was part of the green plan. Right? But yeah, it's and it's yeah. always someone, one of their friends that. Right. Anyway, but in some countries, public transportation is extremely valuable. It's part of their culture, though. Not just part of the culture. It really does save money, makes a big difference, and it's very valuable. New York City, for example, well, in some cases, makes it. It's very yeah, good. but I think that I think that was how, why this failed was because it's it's that that way of transportation has is ingrained in the culture for so long that it's just the way people do things. And the city and it's not that it that wouldn't way. be it's not that it wouldn't be beneficial right now. I mean, if yeah. there was a, a train yeah. that went underground that took me from my house to here, it would be way better than sitting in traffic like I have to. But because we are we are so accustomed here to driving all also, over the place. Also, we don't have the infrastructure. Yeah, it would cost so much culture. money. Yeah. It would cost so much money. But I don't... This is interesting to pay to subsidize private transportation, like e-bikes, scooters. I mean, who knows? Maybe they'll throw Uber, Uber in there. It, no, it is. this. So this it doesn't show it. This one, I, this jug just pulled up the first thing, but I read an article that's, hmm. you know, like basic income, uh, you know, the uh, UB, uh, UBI, right? Except for for all things transportation, and then it would you you would get like a but a five hundred dollar, 
you know, card every month and you it works on all of those things to use for transportation. Okay, now I'm going to take mm. it a step further. Fine. So taxpayers so are, are all paid It's for this. $300 yes. uh, sh- uh, on a prepaid debit card. Not all that uh, who apply will be approved. Up to 500 participants will be randomly selected. Oh, they're testing it. Yeah, this is the uh, Oakland one. So Oakland's yeah. already, there's Oakland and some other places are already currently testing this. But it's very interesting to me because it's already moving in this direction that we talked about where maybe people are not going to own cars anymore. And mm. when you do the math on, I mean, when you talk about car insurance, gas, uh, the car payment, uh, maintenance on the car, you average, they, I've seen this before and they average it out yeah. per year on average what the, the, the average American spends. And then they look at like, what if that same person was provided, you know, unlimited access to all this or that. And they, they actually said that they could save already. We are, we have the ability to save money by doing now, that. Now here's where I would, I would take it a step further you're going to give someone a gift, like a debit card for $300 for transportation. There's a bit of bureaucracy there to check things, to administer this. In other words, they're getting $300, but it probably costs taxpayers, I don't know, $400 or $500. Why don't you just give people, if you want to give people money, just give them money and then use it however you want. You want to spend on transportation? That's cool. You want yeah, to spend on daycare? They, that's then cool. They, then the initiative that they're trying to accomplish. I know what they're trying to accomplish. It's not going to work. Like it's, you give you give a bunch. If you give five hundred, well, because you, you give five hundred people in Oakland, San Jose, or any place for that matter, uh, a three hundred dollar three hundred dollar bill versus three hundred dollars that they have to use on this these these. Yeah, they're I not going to use it for that. I know it's all it's all controlled. Dude. Yeah, yeah, but it's control not. People. But it, exactly, it's not about this. Isn't this isn't like welfare where it's trying to help somebody who needs help with money? This is about about encouraging people to use transportation that is going to benefit the environment, and so they have to keep it like. Oh, that. this is for green because yeah. I think you have to qualify for it. Yeah, that's what I think. I think it's that's just right now. What you just read was Doug pulled up Oakland's. They're testing it just like they just did the UBI with Oakland. You had to qualify to be even the test group to do it. Yeah, it's they're using the people to prove if it's a valuable thing or not. I just think if I think if if hmm. people knew how how what percentage of each dollar. That is that we take in taxes that's supposed to go to programs to help people. So this and welfare and housing and daycare and education subsidies, all that stuff. If you could see how much of that dollar went to the bureaucracy, that all the government people and there's stuff a much that- easier free market answer to this. I mean, it's a, a similar example that would be like the. Um, the, the golden pass that you have for California and uh, it, like all the ski resorts. So I can buy a pass. It's like $1,200 and I can use it at every single, right. at every single resort in, in, in California. And I think Colorado, Nevada, something like that. Right. So you would just do something where instead of, you know, subsidizing it, making it a government program, like allow people to charge a card mm-hmm. with their own money. Mm-hmm. Let me put $300 a card. And then now I can use this for all these different modes of transportation right. just to simplify it. So then it, it's like, it makes it very easy for me to go, hmm, I can either get a car, I can get a car payment and insurance, which would cost me on average of uh, plus gas and or offer thing. tax benefits. Yeah. Or $600 or so a month. That's right. And then off and also give some sort of a tax perk. To do this, there's there's your free yeah. market answer. Yeah, they allow no. people to put their own money and charge it in that card. Give them some sort of a tax kickback. You don't need anybody to oversee yeah. it and manage it. Yeah, it's but that, even that if cut you, and dry. even if people didn't have the money, and let's say we want to help them with some kind of social safety net, just give people cash. Just give them money. Do what you want with it. You're gonna make some bad decisions. Fine. Some I mean, to me, make, that that just it's, it'll it's putting save the cart us before so the horse. In my opinion, like the first thing to do is to prove that. It makes sense. The average person would want to do it. Then when we see that people start to adopt it, they like it, they start using it, then you go, hey, here's a way to help people out that have lower income. I don't think so. I think we're already spending this much money on all these programs. Let's let's just say per person it's $10,000, which I don't know what the number is, but I'm just going to use that number. We're already spending that money. And we know that uh, of that ten thousand dollars, three thousand dollars goes to the bureaucracy. So we're going to say, look, here's what we're going to do. Bro, gonna I, love, I love your, your free market libertarian mind, but you 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 fail to realize how many people need to be told what to do. Yeah. It's fucking as much as I I, I know I, that's the attitude of the people that want to control other people. I don't think so. I think they'll be better off. You cut the bureaucracy, give the people the money. I'm sure a percentage of them will. I don't disagree that a percentage of those people will. But the truth is, there's a good percentage. There's people that want to be led, bro. Don't I don't want to be told. No, no, no. If you you look at the the use of some of these things, people are trade. They're selling their food stamps just for cash, making less money than it's worth because they're trying to do other things. There's a whole black market for a lot of this stuff. I don't. I see it being so much more valuable. You know. You know. What it reminds me of Peter Schiff. I think that's his name. 
Did you see his tweet that he did on taxing billionaires? I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Oh, uh, really I did smart, see that. Yeah. That was what did he say? That was really he said smart. instead of taxing billionaires on their more on their income, what you should do is is add uh, luxury taxes to things that they buy. Right. So make add like a tax to and, yachts yeah. and jets and really expensive pro so that when billionaires go to spend money on themselves. Then they're spending a lot in taxes. I thought that was brilliant too, but doesn't luxury tax already uh, exist? Is yes. that already a thing? Yeah, but you can hike it up. Instead of taxing them on their income, which could go to innovation, investment, mm -hmm. their companies. Creations of jobs. Yeah. Tax them when they go to spend it on on luxury shit. That no, makes I, so much more sense. No, I agree. You go buy a yacht or a Ferrari, paying an extra 3 to 5% in taxes on that for that person is not probably going to change their mind whether they buy or not. And that's that amount of money could go into helping the overall economy. But I think that just making taxing their income, which in turn hurts the way they grow and scale their business is a silly way to do yeah, it. And, so and I it thought was, that was brilliant. Yeah, I think that's so brilliant. And it, along those lines, when we're giving people money... But then so much of it is wasted for all this bureaucracy so because we had to tell people how to use it. No, I'm sorry. It's only for child care. I know you need, you know, I know you need more education, but sorry, this is only for child care. You got to apply over here for that other subsidy or whatever. And it's such a mess. Just give people cash. I mean, I, stra I straddle back and forth on on that on that right so i just i don't think anything's perfect by the way like i, I you know definitely i think we all agree on that and uh i i want to believe that in in this complete free market that it would it would work the way we're saying but well you realize it's not a free market it's 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 still a government funded you know it's you're still getting taxed to pay for the social safety net so it's not full free market but it has the it has the components of the market in the sense that Nobody spends their money better than the people who who have who risk losing it, and you give people freedom. Some people are going to spend it on stupid shit. That's true, but some people. Are I mean, spend it's, it on it's starting no, a business. It's not that different than the Signos uh, conversation we were just having. It, the truth is, who will it really help? The people that are already probably budgeting their money and good with it and making good choices. Who is it not going to help? The people that are taking advantage of welfare and doing that bullshit anyways. It's still not going to help. You're them right, no matter but what. who's getting hurt right now? The people who want to move ahead, but they only got money for shit they're not going to use. I mean, your or, your idea in theory is that you you're just simplifying it so there's less simplifying government, it, less government it, officials it saves and stuff. Way in, more in money. Oil. Our tax dollars go straight. Theoretically, to the it does. Yeah, theoretically. I, and so I think that's and it's just like school choice. Like I think if people could take their public school money. And then choose the school they want their kid to go in. Instead of being stuck in the shitty school that's in their 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 crappy neighborhood, like my God, how well, are I've kids always supposed to move I've ahead? always thought yeah. well, we schools should be competitive. If schools are com competitive, then I you would see this raises everybody. Up you, yeah, point, you would see yeah. this rise in, in in competition for sure. Oh yeah, I mean I, I can imagine a single parent who's in this neighborhood and like man, that school's terrible that I that I forced to go to. And my kid's getting state money to go there. Why can't I just pick another public school? I'm going to pick that nicer one over there. And then, you know, the good ones grow and the, the shitty ones shrink. I think yeah. it's, you know, super valuable. Did you one. guys also see all the, the companies that are starting to break up right now? J&J uh, &J is breaking up. Yeah, uh, General Electric is starting to divide up into... Johnson & Johnson? Mm-hmm. So, like, so, you know, Johnson & Johnson's like, you know, Q-tips and, and Listerine or whatever. They, like mouth heat for all kinds of things. So well, and part of their... So strategy? it's like you're going to have a, like, a no, good, goods, goods and mm -hmm. services type of business and then you'll have pharmaceutical. Yeah. You know, so they can separate. And... So, and and supposedly it's a it's a smart strategy to get more money and more backing because there's certain people that probably invest in J and J that they invest in J and J because of what they're doing with drugs. Right. And there's other people that are like, oh man, they crush it on the retail side. Yep. And so what it'll end up doing is it'll attract more money that's more specifically allocated towards where you see them doing the work that you want to see. So supposedly G and General Electric. Um, who I saw like two other big companies. It's happened. Several companies are doing it right yeah. now. You know what's really weird? Hmm. So, um, you know, I've been listening to that podcast you referred me to. All in. I want to give him a shout out. Great podcast. By the way, if anybody knows a host, let us know. We'd love to meet and talk with them. Been trying to get a hold of them. A exceptional podcast. But they and they're really really smart when it comes to investments and money and the markets. Super super high level. Very very entertaining. And they made a really good point. They said basically you could have thrown your money at anything over the last ten years. And you would have made money. And they're like, art, yeah, baseball it's, cards, it's been really stock crazy, market, right? real estate. And they're all like, it's kind of bubbly. Everything's kind of bubbly. And I was like, that's true. I can't think of a single 
general investment you would have done in the last 10, 15 years that would have made This is what scares me about the, the crypto run right now. It's so crazy for me to even for sure. to even hear myself speak differently about crypto. When we first started talking about crypto, of all of us, I was the most pro. Yeah. And now I feel like I've shifted the other direction. And it's because of how many people, it's purely on speculation. You are buying that cryptocurrency, speculating that somebody else is going to pay you more. It is not, it's not on any anything else. It does not provide any more value to your life or potentially someone else you are and it reminds me of the ghost towns in china yeah you literally are buying property speculating on that someone else will think it's just as valuable or more valuable in a year or five years from now and you're banking on only that it has no it's not functional you can't use it for anything it's not even shelter yeah. I, I feel like the same thing with this crypto it's like we have no idea okay what what crypto is for sure going to be the one that most people accept or what companies are still going to continue and go and so you're you're betting on some news and some hype that you hear and and you're really crossing your fingers that hey, hopefully it'll it'll Shiba in the next two months, <laughs> yes. and I can become a, a millionaire too. But it's like there's not because of the technology is brilliant, not because the company is doing something revolutionary or new. It's purely off of speculation. It's those it's those, those rare stories, right? Like, oh, I know somebody that made a hundred million dollars, and you know, it's it's See, it's I'm, known people, but I haven't known when they actually converted that to cash. Yeah, realized it. Yes. Mm. Have you, like, because I know I've heard that quite a bit, but I have not heard people being able to convert that to cash and then being able to yeah. take that Pull in. Pull it out and, and buy then, a cheeseburger. And then it. being like, I'm done. I'm done yeah. with crypto. You have to have a buyer, right? On the exactly. Other it's, Bitcoin it's, it's is not as easy as I think people yeah, realize. Yeah, Bitcoin is pretty liquid, right? There's typically buyers for Bitcoin, but some of these other ones, you might be yeah, stuck. Yeah, Bitcoin because it's one of the foundational ones. Yeah, so you might be stuck, right? You might have And even, this- again, even on that, it's still speculation. I mean, I think it, you are, uh, it has the, obviously, the um, most likely to be accepted. Yeah. Um, if we go full on cryptocurrency, and even if we don't go full on, it's most likely to be the one that people, and people are, exchange, there's places, uh, lenders are taking it. There's definitely people. There's a lot of drug dealers that are using it. So it's <laughs> it's being used. There's always what, a market for it. Yeah, one hundred percent. It's being used. So I'm not denying that. But buying it the way it's going right now is is purely speculative. It's you are banking that someone is going to give you more money for it in six six months. To you know a what's year. funny too is the and you look brilliant right now, like you said. I know. And they have this yeah. like they have this army of like fervorous crypto maniacs, especially on social media and on the internet. I, I guarantee follow Joey Schwartz for bro, all my I, stock tips. I know. When yep. he did it, that's what I mean. <laughs> I guarantee you in the comments of, of this. Oh, I'm going to piss somebody <laughs> there's off. There's going to be so many. Oh, you don't even know. Crypto is yeah. uh, bro, double my income with, with crypto. I yeah. just, I, I mean, whatever. More power. And I, I, boy, I'm not hating. I mean, I hope I hope you make millions of dollars and I hope it's you've done well doing it and more power to you. I just... I prefer an asset that's actually something that produce, does something. producing income for you. Yeah, you yeah. Can, something that's doing something. Yeah, you can take that same amount of money and put it into something. You put it into companies that are paying dividends or that's growing and scaling and has a product and you can watch it get better yeah. or you can put it in real estate where you can rent the property out, cash flowing it. It's an actual real asset. This is not a, it's not a hard asset. Uh-huh. It's it's all speculative. So. And, and, and a lot of greed plays into it because you're like, I don't want to sell, even though I made 300%, I don't want to sell because what if it keeps going up or whatever. Exactly. Take, yeah, I would say, you know, I'm not a financial advisor, but the way I would look at it is I would take that money out real quick. Okay, I made some money. Now let me yeah, put no, it in put something it in real that assets. Historically, he's got some stability, right? Well, but, speaking of that, Justin, did you see? I know Sal saw because he sent it over the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac ex- extending out the loans to the government. Uh, back, oh, yeah. yeah yes, government backed loans going up to Just a million, keep, a million dollars pumping now. Pumping it up. Oh, my God, dude. They're well, crazy. you know what? This, they had to do this if, 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 if. So one of the thing, one of the things that a lot of people said, like, you know, what was going to happen with this real estate? The people that thought it was going to bubble, it was going to burst any day. Now was like, at one point, these houses are going to go beyond what people can reach, yeah, that mm-hmm. they can get loans for, that they can afford the down payments. But they just boosted this another two hundred thousand dollars plus on average, and so they can actually back these and people will get these loans. So and just get, guess what? I don't think we're going to see ever again like NAGAM loans, but don't be surprised. We start seeing more government programs to encourage yeah. people to watch us like a lot of 40 year loans start coming out. Yeah. Watch, watch, the, watch oh them come God. out with things to encourage people to get tied up in a loan, to get tied up into a mortgage for the rest of their lives. Just so inflation they own a home. is good. That's yeah, that's right. What, uh, What'd you say? It's, it's, it's a good, good thing. thing inflation's good. That's what the, that's, that's what, what, CNN <laughs> that's what some of the media is saying. <laughs> yeah. Shut your mouth. You know what the 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 problem is is that you don't want to be the politician 
that, yeah, that stops, that says, the, gra- hey, stops the gravy chain. Yeah. Hey, everybody, <laughs> exactly. we're going to feel some pain. You know, I got to raise interest rates. Sorry, things are going crazy. Nobody wants that bubble to burst on their watch. Nobody right? wants to do yeah. that. And so they're just going to pump it up until there's a calamity, you know, because nobody wants to be. Remember, in, uh, in the 1970s, the way they stopped inflation was they, ra- they jacked up interest rates, which caused the recession for a couple of years. And then there was a boom, right? Because things got cleaned out. You know what the problem, by the way, with raising interest rates is? We have so much debt that if we raise interest rates to control inflation, we, can't we won't be able to service the debt. Yeah. Yeah. We are literally- We're beyond repair there. Bro, we yeah. are stuck, which I is know. why you should buy crypto. And what the, <laughs> crypto is and what's the, back the average person has to understand is the people that are making these decisions don't give a fuck about you. They they, they, they wrap it up. It's like putting pig on a lipstick or lipstick on a pig, making you think- <laughs> You that can put this pig is, on a Or a yeah. gorilla. Yeah, uh, yeah making you think back, that yeah. they're trying to help you out and all these programs. No, dude, they, they're helping themselves. Yeah. They all own stock in lots of different companies. They all have real estate. And so they don't care the price of milk or gas or things that are going up a dollar, four dollars. What does it matter to them if you have millions of dollars in assets like companies and like real estate? They don't give a shit. So that you guys got to be careful. The people that are voting for this stuff to go through, man, it's going to get really weird. And we just did another one trillion got passed yesterday. Just throw it out of a helicopter, sprinkle it on everybody, see what happens. Yeah. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Look, if you're watching this podcast or listening to it, it's because you like to stay healthy and fit, but you also like to enjoy your quality of life. You know we do the same thing. We're not fanatics. We're not zealots. Although fitness and health is very important to us, we also like to enjoy ourselves. For example, occasionally we like to drink together. It's a good time. We bond. Justin takes his shirt off. It's great. It's awesome. But here's the deal. The next day my workouts suck because alcohol makes me feel like crap the next day. That is until I started using a product called Z-Biotics. Z-Biotics is the first genetically modified bacteria drink, so it's a probiotic, but it's modified, patented by the way, no one else does this, to where the bacteria produce a compound that break down the negative byproducts of alcohol. So here's what you do. You drink your Z-Biotics, then you go drink and enjoy yourself with your friends, make sure you stay hydrated, get a good night's sleep. You wake up the next day feeling way better than if you hadn't taken Z-Biotics before, and it works. It really, really works Go check them out. Head over to zbiotics.com. That's Z B I O T I C S dot com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump 10. That's mind pump one zero with no space for 10% off your first order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from La Flinsta. How much more progress can be made with four gym sessions per week versus three full body workouts a week? Okay, so oh, like more this. is not mm, always yes. better. What? The right dose is what's going to be best for you. And the right dose is dependent on your own individual context and your body and your training experience. Most average people will get best results with about three full body workouts a week. If you're pretty consistent, uh, you've been working out for a little while, that fourth day, I think you could throw in mobility or some trigger sessions. You'd be fine or maybe do an upper lower split. But honestly, more is not always better. Sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's not. You can get a lot done with three days a week. Well, I'm going to go further and say most times it's not. It's actually very rare that I, I meet a client that um, four days a week of them in the gym is going to be better for them than doing a three-day a week full body routine. Other than the only other exception that I feel is the the people that have already built a consistent routine of like, oh, this is my one hour every single day I go to the gym or I exercise. And so in that case, I would still structure them a three day a week strength training, full body type of routine. And then I would encourage mobility and yoga and walks on the other days and say, okay, still go to the gym. So, you know, you can go to the gym four five, six, seven days a week and it'd be extremely beneficial, but a four day uh, split type of routine versus a three day full body. I have found in my experience that more people have benefited from the three day than the four day a week. Now there are exceptions to the rule. Of course I've, and when I'm uh, uh, coaching competitors. Yeah, many of them are training in the gym, but we're talking about high level athletes that are getting on stage and competing yeah. and been training for a long time. The general population, most of them do much no. better here. Well, and two, like if you keep it within that three day structure, uh, you can ramp up intensity. You can mess with the different acute variables uh, within that framework, which also, too, I think people just 
like just forget all about the recovery process. Like that's a huge part of your success in terms of being able to adequately recover and then adapt and then, you know, gain muscle. All that is a vital part of the process. So uh, to have that structure, it's just it's a nice balanced structure, that three day a week schedule. Adding another one. I mean, yeah, you could kind of like uh, change your focus a bit in the gym or, you know, if you add it like six days a week, but you'd have to make sure that the majority of, of the hard foundational type workouts were, you know, adequately spaced out. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I along those lines, I think it's great to be active every single day. I think it's For sure. great to do something every single day. But when we're talking about structured, you know, resistance training, uh, you know, which is geared towards building strength, building muscle, there's a certain level of intensity, right? Three days a week is ideal for most people. Now, again, you can be active all those other days. You could do things like trigger sessions or mobility work or walking, or if you like, if you're into sport. You could do the sport type activity, but you know more than three days a week of actual resistance training. I think is should be reserved for people who are really advanced, who've got great recovery. Um, and if that's you, if you've been working out for a year or two consistently, and you want to add a fourth day of real you know traditional resistance training, I think that's totally fine. But uh, you're not going to get you're not gonna, at some point there's diminishing returns. At some point you'll add an extra day and you'll get a little bit of benefit. You add an extra day and you start to get negative benefit. I mean when Doug hired me. He, worked, he did two full-body workouts a week for, I think, two years before he even moved to a third day. And then well, he did that for like a couple of years before moving on to more. Well, I'm mm-hmm. glad you brought him up because he wasn't a, a beginner lifter either. No. He was exp- And because I was just going to say after you said that about reserve for advance, I'd say I'd proceed with caution even if you're advanced. This was one of the most pivotal moments in my training career. I'd already been training for almost a decade yeah. before this came together for me. I was six days, seven day a week. And I remember dropping yeah. down to three. It blew my mind. I was in the gym half as much lifting weights, and my body was progressing faster than it ever had in the previous five to seven years. So uh, it, more is just not more. You just, you think that the more you hammer the weights and you hit it, the better your results are going to be. It's just not true. And I would say more often than not, it isn't. So I always start with less. Start with less, see how much you can accomplish with that, and then build upon that. Next question is from F.B. Salas. Is there a huge difference between a regular deadlift and a hex bar deadlift? What's the difference, and am I missing out on anything beneficial by not doing the hex bar? There's a, there's definitely a difference. I would even maybe call them different exercises. Um, yeah, both of them I, are I called agree. deadlifts. Now, hex bar deadlift, I think, or trap bar deadlift, I think, is a great way to start deadlifting. It's easier to do. It places less potential strain on the low back. I would have a lot of clients start with a trap bar deadlift. For athletics, sometimes it's more valuable because it's more functional for certain types of sports. Um, but as far as like working the body the same, a trap bar deadlift, you're going to get more of that anterior yeah. chain. You're going to get more quad, less of the posterior chain. You know, when a bar's in front of you, the weight's in front of you, that does change the exercise quite a bit. Do I think they're interchangeable? Maybe. I mean, I've gone through periods where I've, just train traditional deadlifts for so long that I feel like I need a break. Then I switch to the trap bar and then I go back to my normal straight bar and I feel better. But I don't necessarily think that they're always interchangeable. I think they're very different in the feel. You well, know, I, I think, well, and this person's asking, right? They deadlift already and they're asking, are they missing out on anything by not doing the hex bar? I think if you're conventionally deadlifting, you are checking enough of the boxes that missing out on the hex bar, you're not missing out on a ton. Yeah. I think if I you agree. only hex bar deadlifted and you never conventional deadlift, you're missing there's, more. There's, you're missing more by not conventional yeah. deadlifting. That's how, now that all that being said, um, I always think there's value in different movements, a different exercise. It's a different exercise and it's got different applications to it and it has value for multiple reasons, uh, scaling back uh, sometimes, more athletic performance. You can do explosive things with it a little bit better, easier. I love a uh, hex bar deadlift for teaching a client. Sometimes yep. clients can't get into a conventional deadlift position and so a hex mm-hmm. bar is a great place to, to regress them and start them off before you progress them to a conventional. But as a lifter who is already conventionally deadlifting, um, I don't think you're missing out on a ton not by hex bar deadlifting. Yeah, and I think too, like in terms of your point of it being two different exercises, I look at it 
uh, the you know conventional deadlift as being more hip hinge, right? Yeah. And versus like it, it to me, it feels more of the the hex bar uh, deadlift is more of a squat. It's like totally. squatting with weight in your hands. It's basically squatting just from yeah from a different loading uh, perspective, uh, which. You know, it, it helps to kind of more evenly distribute, and, and maybe it does. You know, distribute a bit more on the anterior uh, chain versus the posterior, but uh, at least it's like a little more more evenly uh, distributed uh, that load versus like the deadlift really forces you to you know have everything uh, in, in good communication posteriorly, and nothing really focuses like exclusively on the posterior chain like a deadlift. So I agree to those points of it being probably like if you're not including conventional deadlifts, you might not be receiving the, the amount of, of benefits you would uh, otherwise. Yeah, I, I and you can lift a lot more with the trap bar, that's for sure. You I, can. I can lift about, if, I'm, if I recall, about 70 pounds more. Yeah. So whatever my max is in a traditional deadlift, I could typically do 60 to 70 more pounds on a trap bar because I get more quad in, involved. Yeah, but in terms of technique and being able to teach this to like young athletes, I prefer the trap bar. I do too. You know, mainly because of just that well, risk reward and just like the amount of time it takes to really get their mechanics and, and that, you know, established. So uh, you can still get the benefit there uh, otherwise, yeah. but uh, and you can't both explode. are good. And you're not going to do explosive deadlifts with a straight bar, but you can do explosive uh, trap bar deadlifts. You could jump with a trap bar. Definitely. Try doing that with a barbell in front of you. Definitely. You can do farmer carries with the, with the trap bar, I think more effectively too. Next question is from Grant Satterthwaite. If isometrics don't build muscle, what is their utility in training? Yeah, Who said they don't build muscle? Exactly. I know. <laughs> Who said that? Let's fix that first. Yeah. Isometrics build muscle. All forms of muscle contraction contribute to muscle growth. Now some more than others. But that doesn't mean you only should focus on one because the others have no value. They all have value. But here's the value of isometrics. First of all, they do build muscle. Yeah, there's many studies that prove that. Yeah, you way. will build muscle with isometrics. Not to the extent you will with like full range of motion training. But one of the benefits of isometrics is I can focus on a specific range of motion. If I'm weak at the bottom of a squat, I can really focus on that bottom position of the squat. If I really want to connect to a muscle, isometrics really are effective at allowing me to connect to specific muscles. It's also not as damaging. Like I can go high intensity isometrics and it's not going to require the same recovery that you know traditional kind of resistance training is going to do. So isometric, here's the deal. Everybody's always asking, what can I add to my routine to make it more effective? Now, so long as you don't overtrain, Isometrics is usually one of the best answers. Yeah. You can add isometrics to almost any routine. You'll take this much more recovery, but you'll get this much more in return. Well, so yeah, and the irony, it's like it it spans all the way from the very, very beginner to the advanced. Yes. Like there's benefits all the way across the board. And it's it's kind of funny that they said that you don't build any muscle when in fact any muscle contraction, whether it's like eccentric, concentric, or isometric, either one of those is gonna, you know, actually actively stimulate the muscle in, in order to produce, you know, some kind of an output. So, you know, it's gonna stimulate the muscle, it's gonna affect the muscle, which in fact, if you do them you know, enough times it's going to help them grow and develop uh, as well. But yeah, isometrics, I mean, I think it's just because it's just not as popular, not as familiar. It's not mm -hmm. as sexy. Um, you know, people don't like to focus on that portion, uh, you know, of contraction very often, but there's so many other benefits to it that uh, get you really connected to the central nervous system. It actually, you know, acts as a way to alleviate pain, uh, almost uh, instantaneously, yeah. which is a very amazing feature of it. Uh, and then building muscle, of course, is another you know huge uh, part of that. Process. Well, I think it's because in the moment, all right, initially, in, in, if you compare it directly to the eccentric or concentric portion of the exercise, it doesn't build as much. So I think, and it, it and and I say that like in the moment, meaning like you know what the. Uh, What's that thing that you and Jessica always say, Sal, the, your type one fun and your type two fun? Yeah. You have like fun that is like fun while you're yeah. in the moment. Like think of that. Like, it feels like more work. Yeah. And then, then you have like type two where it's like you get added benefits later on. Like that's how I think of like the isometrics. The isometrics may not feel like or does not seem like you are building as much muscle as full range of motion exercises in the moment, but it has this great carryover later on to the points that you're making, Justin, right now with like CNS, like your ability to contract like that and get a stronger, better contraction recruit more muscle will only in turn make you better at your full range of motion yep. exercises later on, right. which will, will only make you build more muscle later on. So 
not training it because you think it doesn't add as much mu muscle or build as much muscle as a full range of motion exercise doesn't mean that it doesn't have tremendous benefit. This is another example, too, of how studies can suck sometimes. If you took a study that showed these people only did isometric contractions for six weeks, these people only did concentric, these people only did eccentric, which one built the most muscle right. over the course of and six days? You're just looking at size or something. Yeah, you're, you're going to look at yeah. your, your, in by itself in a study for six to eight weeks, you're right. The eccentric and concentric full range of motion is going to probably beat out for total muscle gain than the isometric. Yeah, but the isometric still built muscle. Right. You know, when you have yeah. all three contractions, concentric, which is the lifting, right? Eccentric, which is the lowering, and then isometric, which is this, it's not moving, but you're contracting hard, either pushing against an immov immovable object or just doing it intrinsically. If you compare all three, eccentric builds the most muscle. Second place would be concentric. Third place would be isometric. Right. Yeah. But what we don't, what people forget is they all built muscle. Yeah. That means if you add them to each other, you get this cumulative it's effect. A compounding. Yeah. That's yes. what I'm saying by that, right? Yes. So it's like even though in a study like that, if we we're comparing, you go, oh well, I'm not going to waste my time with that one because it's the third most beneficial when it comes yeah. to building muscle. But that doesn't tell the whole story of what the carryover you're getting from training. Yeah. By the way, bodybuilders have a long history of isometric training. In the 70s, Arnold used to talk about doing it to sharpen and harden his muscles. Bodybuilders today still do a lot of isometric training. Now they don't talk about it in their workouts because they don't consider posing as a part of the workout. But yeah. bodybuilders are posing constantly, especially before competition. What is well, posing? It's all isometrics. And by the way, for people who are like, uh, oh, posing's easy. No, it's not. No. When you're on stage and you're doing a front double bicep, you don't just flex your arms. You are contracting and controlling everything. Strongman's a better example. Even even better. Right? I mean, they got to carry objects in an isometric position. I mean, they're moving with weight so a lot of times, but also, too, they have events where they're actually just holding on to really heavy objects that are pulling them apart, and they have to, like, squeeze as hard as possible. There's lots of events centered around just if they can keep <laughs> their, their, their position, you yeah. know, intact and, and, and strong in that position. So, you know, isometrics play a huge role. Next question is from Twin Sanity Fitness. What is your advice for someone who wants to start online coaching but has no experience? All right, so I'm going to go first specific, okay? We work with a company called NCI Coaching, and they are, in, in my opinion, the best in the business at taking coaches and, and getting them to the point where they're successful online. And, and success as defined by getting their clients good results, but also it's one of the only certifications that focuses on getting these coaches to build their business. That's yeah. another part of being an effective coach is you got to be good with your clients, which is a big part of it. Obviously, be a good trainer or coach, get people results, do a great job there. But there's a business side too. And that business side, you don't learn from almost any certification. NCI does both. Now, I'm going to be more general. Yeah. Okay, here's more general advice. Go be a trainer at a big box gym for a year before you try doing online coaching. If you're new, if you're brand new, I think you'll learn, you'll become so much better online if you train people in person first for at least a year. Because I believe online coaching, especially when it comes to fitness, like exercise, is harder than being in person. In person, I can give, I can watch you move, I can see cues. I, if I don't have that experience and I'm texting with someone and they're mm -hmm. explaining how an exercise feels, I'm going to be clueless. But if I've trained people a hundred times and they say, man, it's really weird when I do uh, cable rows, I feel kind of pain in my lower back. And I know, oh, tighten your abs while you're pulling the weight because I've trained people in person so much and I've done that cue to help them. So that's more general. Do some personal training in person at a big box gym. They'll provide you with opportunities. It's easier to get clients there. Do that for a little while, then go online. No, that's why I'm glad that we've sort of been a part of this and, and been a part of these conversations with these coaches and trainers because this question comes up a lot. And a lot of them are brand new to the space. And I do agree, you know, the physical part of it is hard to replicate. But, you know, the part of that process is being able to figure out what the right questions are to ask and to be predictive with that in terms of like staying ahead of your client's needs and being able to kind of, you know, sharpen it down to what the, the bare essentials are for, for them to focus on. So you're not overwhelming them with everything. And I think that, you know, with NCI, they, they've built in like all of these things in terms of like systems for, for them to kind of help these coaches figure out, I need to create these systems. So that way, you know, my client feels like everything is under control. Like, uh, you know, I, at that 
way it's somewhat predictive uh, and they can kind of replicate that with with other um, and individualize it and customize it but you need a framework there to be yeah. able to work off of first and I so that, I think that's one of the hardest parts to create first when you're moving online because uh, if you don't have that experience right away, uh, it's really difficult to, to figure all that out. Well, I'm going to add one more shameless plug, which is uh, you guys plugged to NCI. Well, uh, we have a mentorship with NCI. So if, and is it, Doug, is it mindpumpnci.com or is it NCI mindpump.com? Mindpumpnci.com. So mindpumpnci.com. And you have the, you have the opportunity to meet with us, Zoom with us, each one of us once a week. So every Wednesday, and it's all trainers. So these are all trainers and coaches, both in-person and virtual coaches that are asking these types of questions. So uh, if you're not, and it's it, unbelievably cheap for what you get. Uh, so under $100 a month for you to be able to have access to all four of us, including Jason and his team. Um, I think there's tremendous value in there and nothing will ever beat in person, hands on training one on one. But if you're limited on how much of that you can do, uh, this is, in my opinion, the next best thing. Or if you have the ability to do both in conjunction would be great, would be going through the mentorship, learning from NCI. And then in addition to that, also getting some hands on practice so you can apply the knowledge and information that you're hearing from us. Yeah. You know, Adam, I want to ask you a question because I know you managed trainers for a long time, as, as, as did I. At what point did you realize that you would produce more successful trainers by teaching them the business rather than just teaching them to be better trainers? Almost instantly. It was something that, and this is truly what what made me a good fitness manager and even a good trainer. I actually talked about this uh, recently on NCI. They were asking, they asked, one of the questions was, Adam, how did you program when you first started as a trainer? And I said, that's the wrong question to ask me <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, because it's not going to be good advice. I wasn't a good trainer. I wasn't... Uh, the, the nutrition and uh, the biomechanics, all that stuff came later. That came later with experience, lots of national certifications. Uh, did I did that come full circle for me? What I was really good at the very beginning was I recognized that everybody was talking about uh, nutrition, physiology, uh, program design. That's where all the energy was flowing. If you heard about a good coach, it was about how well he programmed right. or how well he knew nutrition. It wasn't that this guy like operated a sick business. And I just come from a different background and family and things that I'm into. I'm more into the business side and I was seeking that and I couldn't find it anywhere. And one of the first things I started to do with my staff right out the gates as soon as I started was teaching them how to actually analyze their business by figuring out their show percentage, their clo their closing percentage, the average dollar how they to sell. Present, how to, yeah. yeah. So how to forecast uh, okay, so you say you want to make eight thousand dollars this month. Well, okay, yeah. let, let's Here's just how not, many appointments you need. Yes, to book let's not just throw like a fairy there. tale number out there. Let, let's actually break down like how many people do you need to book? How many people are you going to see? At what percentage are you going to close? At what dollar amount to actually have some so some real strategy around doing that? When I taught my trainers this, and that I was this was where I had a lot of success was being a, later on. The other stuff came, but yeah, that was early. It, it's it, first of all, it's a, it's got to be a given that you need to be a, a good trainer or work on being a good trainer. So mm -hmm. obviously, you don't want to be a crappy trainer because I don't care what else you do. Great, yeah, you're just gonna sell garbage at you're, that point. Yeah, you're gonna suck. It's not gonna. So you got to be a great trainer. But you know, I you know what I used to do with my trainers. I used to trick them because <laughs> a lot of trainers they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear. I just want to train people. I don't yeah. want to. I don't care mm -hmm. about business. I, if I just train people good, and they, they're just they, for whatever reason, oftentimes fitness professionals, especially when they're early. They're like anti-business. All I want to do is help people. And so what I used to do is I used to trick them. I would do weekly trainings with my trainers. And the title of it would be how to activate your glutes more when you're doing your squats or how to correct, you know, common ways to correct shoulder impingement. And they'd come in and I would teach them exercises and techniques for the first 30 minutes. And then the back 30 minutes was I would talk about the stuff that you said, because now I have them in front of me. And it was the most valuable stuff. Yeah. That was the stuff that really was valuable because it learned, they taught, they learned how to become better at what they did, better business, which by the way, bleeds into making you a better trainer. And look, I don't care how much passion you have. If you can't support yourself with your business, you're not going right. to be able to do it. Um, and again, one of the reasons why we chose to work with NCI is they they do place some focus on that. So you're not bl you're not walking into this new career, you know, totally blind. And that's that's a big deal. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have so many guides that can help you with most of your fitness goals. Again, mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsalon. Adam is at mindpumpadam. 